Hello and welcome to Spy Hearts Podcast. I'm Agent Scott. And I'm Kim the Provocateur. And we are continuing the celebration. It's our 100th film. And so we thought we'd roll out the red carpet and get the film's director to tell us all about the making of Spy Hard. Yes, we are talking to Rick Friedberg, the director and co-writer of Spy Hard, the 1996 Leslie Nielsen spoof. We reviewed it this week on the show, but we were very lucky to grab an interview with the man behind the magic. Yes, indeed. I mean, you know, this film is our namesake in a way. Yeah, true. You know, we spoke a bit more about that in the review earlier this week, and we have some special stuff coming up next week as well to celebrate 100 reviews. But without further ado, Cam, roll that interview. And joining us on the show, the director of the film we're talking about this week, the film being Spy Hearts, and the man being Rick Freeberg. Hello, Rick. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thank you. Well, you know, we want to firstly thank you for joining us here on our 100th movie review special. We thought we'd pick a special film and we've got a special man with us. So, um, yeah, I'm really glad you're here today. I am too. Um, but I think how we like to start these interviews is to get to know you a little bit better first before we maybe get to the film in question. All right. So my first question to you is, how did you get started in the film industry? Well, I come from a small town, Cheyenne, Wyoming, and I come from a family that if you weren't a doctor, you had to settle for being a lawyer. Being a filmmaker would would be absolutely unheard of and incredulous. Nevertheless, I went to USC, not film school. I was in psychology, and uh, I always wanted to be a writer and ultimately a filmmaker. And I started at 21 almost 50 years ago, making little Super 8 films on my own. And uh, I eventually, after I graduated college, I moved to LA. I met a guy named John Urey, who was the father of most TV commercial makers in LA. And I had made a parody of the Pepsi commercial and I showed it to him and he wanted to buy a print of it. It it was uh, the first annual 62nd TV commercial, I mean, TV uh, film uh, winner at the Chicago Film Festival. It was a parody of all the the people throwing up football in the surf, you got a lot to live, et cetera. Anyway, he says, uh, I had shot a documentary on rodeo cowboys at Cheyenne Frontier Days, but I didn't have the money to transfer the sound to magnetic tape to sync it up. So he said he would give me a job as an editor and he would let me use a room in a movieola and transfer my sound if I would work for him as an editor, which I did. So over the next 10 years, I edited God knows how many TV commercials for him, probably 2,000. Wow. And along the way, I worked part-time as an assistant director and part-time as an editor on, on other stuff. Well, I decided one day, I was uh, in my late 20s, that I wanted to direct. I was tired of helping other people, and I'm not trying to sound arrogant, but uh, I was trying to help other people on their stuff because the greatest school was editing for directors who didn't do a good job. If I edited for a good director, I never learned anything. At any rate, I started directing commercials. So John calls me up and he says, I got a gig for you. It's the largest commercial package in the history of commercials for Standard Oil. 12 commercials shot all over the world. And I want you to do it. I know you just want to direct, but you're not doing it that often. You're not going to make this kind of money. Do it. And I'll give you the equipment. So he put all the equipment in my garage and I edited his his commercials. And I started doing documentaries and corporate films and that kind of stuff. And the one guy I met, was a guy from my hometown, a Cherokee Indian named George Clayton Johnson, who wrote, uh, my God, I can't remember the name of it. It's a a legendary uh, sci-fi film. And uh, he says, if if you cut this, I wanna make a documentary on futurists. What I wanna do, uh, it was called Logan's Run. Oh yeah, it was shot in mm-hmm. uh, it was shot in Las Vegas, 
And he was a fan of Las Vegas. And his idea at the time, and this goes back to 1972, he wanted to put people in a bunker below Las Vegas of every kind of, uh, every kind of profile, cops, doctors, writers, scientists, sci-fi people, and give them the access to any kind of media they wanted, with the end result being how to use Las Vegas as a microcosm of how to control the world for the next 50 years, a revolutionary concept. And he had shot vin uh, vintage footage of every sci-fi writer there was. And he was really an interesting guy. At any rate, while I'm editing this documentary, I'm simultaneously editing the Standard Oil commercials. So the ad agency from San Francisco would come down and I would have to put away his stuff real quickly and show them the commercials, which they liked. So that led into my deciding that was it. I had to start directing. So over the next 30 years or 20 years, I directed about, God knows, four or 500 commercials, uh, 12 music videos, one of which made me a legend which was Van Halen's Hot for Teacher. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of corporate films, a lot of industrial films, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, at any rate, my, my commercials for Leslie Nielsen, uh, I got a call from the ad agency that had written this stuff and they had to present them to Leslie Nielsen, but they were very insecure about it. And they knew I did some parody, like my Pepsi parody mm -hmm. and wanted my input. So I met with him and I had lunch with Leslie Nielsen and I already had mapped out what we wanted to do by making the uh, ad agency re-storyboard everything that were parodies of Leslie in an airport. And these commercials were shown on the Super Bowl, the NBA playoffs, the World Series, et cetera, et cetera. Pretty popular. And Leslie was on a tour of Naked Gun, either two or three in Europe, and all over Europe, people would talk about the commercials. Uh, so I get a, I'm get i doing a TV series in New York for the Hensons called City Kids. It's about a bunch of high school kids and their various foibles and what they go through. And I get a call from Leslie's agent. And he says, do you want to direct Naked Gun 3 or 4? I can't remember which one it was. I said, why not? So they sent me the script. And I couldn't come out to meet with anybody because I was still directing. And then I came out and I met with Leslie and he said, you've got to meet David Zucker, but I think he already has somebody in mind. So I met David Zucker very briefly and he didn't seem particularly responsive to me because I think he had another director already and he did. So I didn't direct that naked gun. But in the meantime, I had told my son who was in college that I was up for Naked Gun. He, my son and his partner were entrepreneurs. They designed and sold t-shirts uh, that they sold all of the girls in the dorms. And in three weeks, they sold a script. I mean, they wrote a script called To Live and Let Spy that they sent me in hopes that I'd show up to <laughs> Leslie. And well, that's, um, it, well, I, 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 don't, I don't want to interrupt in too much, but like there's, we're at a point now where a spy hard is about to happen, but I feel like we need to talk about the commercial work a little bit more before we get into it, because I okay. feel like you, you, you've, your career has developed, but you've done a, you've done a lot of commercials. Yes. You know, and then we're, we're skip, skimming over, you know, you work with Charlie Sheen, Chevy Chase as yeah. well. Big, big, big names. Chevy Chase. What, what was the commercial I was looking at? AM, AAMI insurance. That was in Australia, wasn't it for Chevy yeah, Chase? It was. I believe? Yes. Because it was sort of lamp, it was talking about the sort of vacation films, wasn't it? That was it the was. idea of that it, one. It was yeah. vacation inspired, and I had great trepidation because uh, working with movie stars is an, a, a, a fine line that you have to dance constantly, unless you've already directed something with them successfully. I had heard nothing but horror stories about Chevy Chase, and mm -hmm. I had great trepidation. When I met him, I fell in love. He was one of those kind of guys that gave you 60 jokes, 58 of which sucked, and the other two were pearls. He was hilarious and so humble and so nice. We got on so well. And he says, where in the fuck have you been all my life? He said, I want to take John Landis and throw him off a cliff. He had <laughs> me and Steve Martin and Martin Short sitting on the edge of the 
uh, Grand Canyon with no rope. I guess John Lowness was a, a, a pretty strong guy in, in getting what he wanted and wouldn't take any counter. Anyway, Chevy and I got along just great. And subsequently, when I finished them, I gave him a script that my agent had gotten to me, written by Mitch Markowitz, who wrote Good Morning Vietnam, which was a really good script about an ad agency exec whose lawyer wife goes on a convention and he's free for 10 days. And there's an intern in the ad agency that tries to seduce him. So he has to get a quickie marriage in Mexico that'll get annulled. So I showed it to Chevy and he wanted to do it. So the second time in my career, and this is, goes back to a note I'll give you now, is if you go into a studio with a celebrity, a star, you either get a yes or no that day. Yeah. If you go into the studio without a star, you usually get something akin, a long-winded, well, we did such and such so-and-so, and the, the focus group said such and such, and you say to yourself, what a fucking waste of time. <laughs> At any rate, going back to Chevy Chase, uh, we had this script. We took it to Warner Brothers, uh, where he did all the vacation films, to the exec he did them for, not knowing the execs were on their way out. And the feedback we got was Chevy was too old and he wasn't marketable anymore. And according to the guys in Australia who wrote the commercials, there was a Chevy Chase vacation movie shown every single night somewhere in the world all year round they were wrong that doesn't really make any that does not track in the early 90s for me chevy chase was perhaps not at the height of his career but you know he had a resurgence in the noughties not long after this anyway so clearly not paying attention to popular culture those guys at, at uh, warner brothers there well they were on their way out chevy didn't know mm-hmm. him. right uh, and i think that was the major problem when when old guys go out of the studio and new guys come in New guys don't want to do what the old guys did. Mm-hmm. And Chevy had a very close relationship with them. Uh, at any rate, that's my Chevy Chase story. He's just, he was just a wonderful guy because for, for many years he had a horrible re- reputation because he was uh, cocaine and alcohol addicted, but he went to AA and CA. He got clean. He apologized to everybody he ever bad mouth or was nasty to and uh, he was a joy to work with well it, it, if we're talking about the commercial work i think at this point you okay. know you've, you've gone from editing right you're also doing your own stuff in the background your documentary you're working on and you're filming commercials for a lot of companies here i was right. on your website earlier there's a, there's a lot of major companies is there a commercial you would point to the, sort of your favorite that you put together oh my god or even one that opened doors for you well, all the Leslie Nielsen opened doors for me, mm. but uh, I'm trying to think the first thing that ever opened doors for me. God, I can't remember. I think it was the Pepsi parody that I did. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, you know, you, you mentioned you've obviously got connected with Leslie through um, for the ad agency and then the Naked Gun thing almost happened. It didn't. Your son worked on the, the concept for Spy Hub, which we'll come back to in a second. But one thing I wanted to ask, and, and it's, it's just about spy movies. Yes. Because Spy Hard obviously touches on a lot of uh, James Bond, things like that. Are you a fan of spy movies? Is that something you grew up watching? Oh, yeah, sure. But I also got into liking really offbeat stuff like Lock, Stock and Two Smoking Girls. And Snatch is still one of my favorite movies. Great film. Yeah. Mm. I had a script, which I, you'll ask me in the future, what do I got next? I had a script that was like a combination of Snatch meets Midnight Run. Oh. It was slightly funny and a, just a great kind of um, combination uh, weirdo film. And it was ri- originally written by a young Canadian guy that just sent it to me blind. So I worked with him and I said, if you let me help you rewrite this and attach me to director, I think we can get this made. It was called Go Get Carlos. But it was the height of the Me Too movement. And it was very male oriented because the subject matter was about a guy whose wife is nine months pregnant and he's a compulsive gambler and he's just blown 50 grand 
on a losing horse to her uncle, who is his bookie. And because it was male oriented, we never could come up with a concept uh, to change the motivation for the character for a woman. And as you know, uh, starting in the late 90s, it was all about women, not just inclusive women directors, but women subject matter. And given what my background was, I was a kind of male oriented writer. I couldn't help it. Well, you, you, you wrote to what you know, and that, that's entirely fine. I think, yeah, we, we've kind of set the table a little bit now when it comes to Spy Hard. So you, you started telling the story. And I did rudely interrupt you, but let, let's get back into it now. So you've okay. obviously met Leslie. Right. You've uh, had that Naked Gun meeting that didn't go well. Obviously, Naked Gun 3 ended up being made. But then your son heard about Naked Gun, and he went right. and wrote a script. Correct. And he got it to me, and I got it to Leslie. And he says, I think it needs a rewrite, uh, but I'll do it. Because at that point, he trusted me. I'd not only done three years of his um, car commercials, I'd also done two vanity golf videos for him mm-hmm. called Golf My Way and How to Play Golf, How to Play Bad Golf Easier. Uh, I was going to ask about those because I couldn't find anything online about them in terms of watching a video. Were they sort of comedy straight to video? Yes. How, how were they pitched? It, obviously, they didn't get theatrically released, but um, did people order them on VHS and they watched them because they were Leslie Nielsen fans? Uh, yes. The, uh, the uh, people who got to him was an English company, very famous, can't remember what it was, but uh, a very, very large sell- selling home video was Dorf on Golf. Yeah. One of the largest. And uh, they wanted to do one with Leslie because they knew he was a golfer. He played in a lot of celebrity pro-am tournaments. So the writer was Henry Beard, who was the co-founder of the National Lampoon and the Harvard Lampoon. And he wrote a script for a video and they got it to me. I never, only never seen golf. I hated it. But Leslie <laughs> told him, he said, Rick knows nothing about golf, but he knows funny. So we went out and what these were, were they're parodies of golf training videos. There was a slew of golf training videos by famous golfers. Uh, I can't even remember their names because I never knew them well. So we went and shot those and they turned out to be the largest selling made for home videos uh, next to North in history. They sold wow. like 20 million units. Uh, and that's how those came about. Did anyone learn any golf skills from those videos? Of course not. <laughs> <laughs> and how did it kind of um, evolve your relationship working with Leslie Nielsen going from the commercials into those golf videos? Uh, it was an ongoing relationship. And, and because we're uh, almost in the incipient st- at the second golf video, I showed him the script in mm-hmm. Toronto. That's where we shot it. And he said, and as I told you, he says, this could use a rewrite. I'd like to give you some input. But if, if you agree to that, I'm in. So uh, what I did, he said, I know that you and Dick Chudnow, my writing partner, had been Dick Chudnow, who was one of the founders of the Kentucky Fried Theater. Mm-hmm. And he says, if you and Chudnow will rewrite it with me, uh, I'm in. So we went to Head's house and had some meetings and uh, we went back by ourselves and wrote, wrote, wrote. And we got it to my then manager, who was an old friend of Joe Roth, who was the current president of Disney. And Joe Roth was a great fan of parodies, having made Hot Shots Part Two, Part Two. Right. And uh, so. It's one of my favorites, uh, that one, actually. It's one of my favorites of the me too. Of me era too. of uh, comedy films. Yeah. And yep. Jimmy Abrams is a great guy. At any rate, uh, my manager got it to Joe Roth along with my commercial reel. So he just demanded a meeting. So we went in with Leslie. And at the time, my manager had got somebody on board who actually gave us some money for the rewrite. And he was this lawyer guy who was involved in getting foreign rights. And he turned out to be a nightmare because he attached himself to the film, getting money, sucking up to Leslie, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, Classic Hollywood sleazebag. So we went in and we see a guy across the table who's about 21 years old. 
And we think this is the guy that gets the coffee because he asked us if he wanted something to drink. We all wanted a water. And Joe Roth comes in and uh, I sit across the table from him and he says, I saw your stuff. I read the script. I want to change this and make it all male oriented action movies, parodies. Because uh, my son had written a parody of Goodfellas and a couple other things that weren't male action. And he said, Charles here, meaning the guy who gets the coffee, will tell you what I like and don't like. Uh, you do a script, get us back to us within 30 days. I'll either give it back to you for free or we'll make it. So we go in the hall and meet with the guy who gets the coffee, who turns out to be exec vice president of Hollywood Pictures. <laughs> and he's... And he says, the first 60 pages are fine, but you got to lose good fellas, you got to lose this, you got to lose that, and come back with male action movies. So we went back. We had a budget of $16 million we'd submitted. So we went back and we wrote a parody of True Lies, Speed, et cetera, et cetera, and cut out the stuff that wasn't uh, action movies and took it, sent it back to him. And uh, in three days, we got a green light. It just, it never happens that nice. It never happens that smooth. And the no, one no. note I'm reiterating twice, if you don't go in with a star and it's exacerbated exponentially now, you don't get a movie. I would just love to know when you talked to Leslie Nielsen initially though, and he said you, um, you know, he would like a rewrite. What were some of his suggestions? What were some of the things that he was maybe concerned about? He was concerned about doing things that were authentic which is kind of crazy because though we wanted to do things that resembled the original films they satirized, mm -hmm. authenticity usually connotes drama. So most of his notes were kind of too, I hate to say this because it sounds shitty, but actory. Right. And my co-writer Dick Chudno, every time we left his house, which is only three times, was so depressed because they weren't funny stuff. Mm. So uh, he really didn't, didn't contribute anything. And what I didn't know at the time was he was constantly in a conflict with the Zuckers and Abrams, telling them what he wanted because they listened to him and nodded and told him yes, and then never did anything about it. But I wasn't experienced as they were, nor did I have two mega hits in my hand so that I could really tell him, well, it didn't work. Hmm. And they could. It's interesting as well, because at this point, he has done The Naked Gun. He's done Airplane, yes. these sort of satirical films. And you would think he would know to play to his strengths, which is interesting that he wants to take it more in an actory, I'll use your word, actory direction. Whereas I don't, I mean, obviously, he was a straight actor when he started in his career, but then his right. career progressed into this. It's strange that he wants to take it back that way, where he's been so successful with this type of film. Well, that's the difference between an actor who sees himself as a creator writer and just an actor. Because the one thing Leslie did brilliantly is he never broke character. He always deadpanned. He was authentic. Mm -hmm. But that's because he was acting and he was playing to his strength as a character he developed in Airplane, which was led by the Zuckers and Abrams. But as a writer creator, there's a, a great gulf between conceiving it and performing it. Right. Yeah, absolutely. So then, okay, so you've got these notes from um, the producing now, the, 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 the studio, of right. what to do with it. So what is, obviously you've lost some of the other film references like Goodfellas, like you mentioned. Right. But I, I imagine at this point, the sort of spy comedy undertone is still there. Yes. Oh, always was. It was predominant, even with the rewrite. Well, then, I, I suppose the question is at this point, what are the major differences apart? Is it just the film references at this stage that, that change? Yes. Right. Okay. How is it, you know, trying to strike that balance between the spy movie spoofs, which at a certain point can only maybe certain, you know, maybe can only please spy fans in the audience versus working in more of those pop culture ones like, you know, Pulp Fiction and what have you, true lies. Like, are you looking to kind of strike a balance between the films you're parodying? Uh, no, I was just trying to get things that were my favorite films that were all iconic. Any, any shot in the film is an iconic shot parody of the original iconic uh, movie. 
for instance, well, and one anecdote, let me jump forward a bit, was from Pulp Fiction, the most difficult thing with Leslie was that he was basically an alcoholic and he came to the set hungover and he wore sunglasses. And the iconic shot, as you know, in Pulp Fiction is this. Yeah. And he, mm -hmm. he wanted to do that with his sunglasses on. So one of the few conflicts I had with him, I said, Leslie, you've got to take your sunglasses off. And um, Nicholas Sheridan, who was so much fun and loved the script and knew the pop culture references, was really my cohort in talking him into things. And even though his eyes were still red, we got him some clear eyes and he did do it. But those kind of things popped up. And uh, that's kind of a hard thing to do when the person you're talking to doesn't know the iconic shots. Right. Yeah, that's, that's very fair. Um, so, okay, you've gone back with the new revisions on the script to the studio now. They've obviously given, they've given you the green light because we're talking about the film now. Right. Um, was there any other notes they gave you at that point or was it just off you go and make the film? No, the problem was all of those things that we put in, like Speed and True Lies, were ungodly expensive. So the budget went from 16 to 19. Fortunately, <laughs> I have been, I'm a fanatic on prep. And I had to go meet with their entire production staff and show them storyboards, shot lists, and daily shot lists, et cetera, et cetera, to justify the increase in budget. Fortunately, the production side, as opposed to the creative side, were very savvy people. And they understood what I had in mind. And I still had to meet the head of production. I had a lunch with her. She was Australian. And she'd been the line producer on the Peter Weir films. And she sat with me and she says, you can't shoot this fucking film in 59 days. I don't care what you tell me. And you're not going to do it. I said, and I taught, and I took her through the storyboards, the shot list, et cetera, which she didn't totally buy, but she liked my enthusiasm and my preparedness. She said, okay, just lay me a bet. If you do this, 100 bucks, and I had a 59 day schedule, and I ended up shooting it in 60 days because one of the stunts, which is the Cadillac limo holding the limousine together in the line of fire parody. Yeah. Mm -hmm. is, over the is hanging over the, the uh, drawbridge. And that particular uh, stunt, which depended on a turntable working with a two ton plate over its rope, didn't work. So we had to shoot an extra day. So I brought it in a 60 days and I had to pay her a hundred bucks. <laughs> to be fair, 60 days is still a very impressive feat. That's a hundred dollars well spent, I think. Yeah. Um, okay, well then, I suppose you've got your script in place now. Obviously, the the feat of getting it shot will get to. But the next step, I think, is is casting. Obviously, you've got Leslie Nielsen in the role, but you've got this whole other you know cast of actors to assemble. You mentioned uh, Nicola Sheridan, who I think is fantastic in the film. But just talk a little bit about casting. Did you have people in mind when you were writing scenes for the film? Oh, How did it go? That was my that was my next uh, total bash with Disney in that they didn't understand the kind of people I wanted and they wanted to, because all they wanted to do was copy the Zuckers and Abrams. All they wanted was ex-TV stars from the 70s, 80s, 90s. I wanted Patrick Stewart to play the bad guy. Oh, nice. Or the guy who had done The Madness of King George, an international star to play the equivalent of the Bondian character who plays the guy. They had already, their legal department had already nixed my idea of making the bad guy named Doc Martens so we could use the shoes and his <laughs> name, but they didn't want to do it because they thought it was too uh, thuggish. They thought only, only bad kids wore Doc Martens, which is not true. Uh, that was, and that started, and they didn't want any of this. Uh, the exec came to me and says, what is this, the British uh, Royal Theatre Club? You want all these guys? Get a TV star. I had already tried to get Joanna Lumley from Absolutely Fabulous oh, nice. because she had been a Bond girl. Yeah. And she read the script and loved it, but she was in a play in London and couldn't get out of it. So I went next to Lena Olin. And they said, who the fuck is Lena Olin? 
who had also agreed to do it and saw my commercial reel, but she wanted $600,000. And Disney said, no way, we want scale. So <laughs> casting was just, it was horrendous. The worst part of casting was the bus driver for the speed parody. I wanted either Ray Charles or Stevie Wonder. And the casting lady at Disney came to me and she said, are you crazy? It was like I had just told her her 12-year-old daughter was pregnant. She just didn't get it. And then two days later, I get a phone call. She says, I get it. This is funny. Go. So I got Ray <laughs> Charles. And for the rest of the time, they let me go. The next guy that was difficult was uh, Robert, what's his name from I Spy? Culp. Robert Culp to play this asshole on the airplane with Leslie. And Leslie had final approval of principal casting. He loved Nicola Sheridan. I had worked with her with uh, Kenny G on a music video, and I knew how funny she was and how playful she was, and I knew she was a jock, so she could do stunts. And she was a lot of fun. Uh, at any rate, he had, he had approval of her, loved the tape I sent of her, he had approval of the Doc Martens character, and I cast, uh, what's his name? Andy uh, Griffith. Andy Griffith, which I had a lot of problem with until I saw his famous movie Face in the Crowd. He was such a wonderful actor. I didn't want him because he was so old, but uh, he turned out to be such a soldier and such a cohort. Uh, the next guy in line, was this asshole on the plane. So we came up with Robert Culp. I came to Leslie. He says, great, get an asshole to play an asshole. Apparently, Leslie had worked with him once on I Spy and said he was the biggest dick in history. And he turned out to be that way. Wow. <laughs> Were there any, because this movie has a lot of cameos, you know, the ones you've mentioned, plus, you know, Mr. T yes. and Fabio and all these. Were there any you tried for you just couldn't get? Yeah, there was one, but I'll get to that. Disney also gave me uh, $50,000 to divide up among as many actors as uh, cameo stunt casting as I could with no more than $5,000 a day and a one-day gig. So we got, uh, what's his name from uh, the Diana Riggs show in Britain, uh, the spy show? Patrick McNee? Yeah, yeah. We got him for a day who turned out to be a great guy. Uh, we got all those people. And the one guy we got was Dennis Rodman to play the tour guide in Kiki Ree Island, where Leslie goes with Nicolette. And we did this and we told him we wanted him to wear, him to wear his wedding dress. Because at the time, Dennis Rodman, I guess you know who he is. Yeah. yeah. Uh, he had once worn a wedding dress in one of his stunts. So, he's, so we got him and he agreed to come and wear the wedding dress and be that guy but he never showed up. Fortunately, we had a guy that we really liked in casting. We cast him instead at the last minute. We had to lay some of the shooting and shoot some other shots. Dennis Rodman has a bit of a history of not showing up for his gigs. He uh, notoriously didn't show up for a basketball game, I believe, because he was filming a bit of sort of WCW Nitro in the around the same period, actually. So maybe it's something connected to that. I do want to take us back a little bit, though, to Patrick McNee, because he got an eyebrow from Cam and I, I think. Either I've missed him. He wasn't in it. They cut him out. There we go. Okay. What was he in? Where was he in the film? What was he supposed to be doing? There's a, a huge melee in uh, the uh, bar near the end of the film where the bad guys come and shoot the place up. And the very last shot is Patrick McNee uh, popping up behind a table saying, check, please. And <laughs> he spent the whole day waiting to do that. I felt so bad. But he was so good and so funny. He cracked everybody up. Disney cut it. Huh. There was a lot of jokes Disney cut, many of which were my favorite jokes. Well, I had that underlined in my notes, just favorite bits that didn't make the movie. Are there any that really jump out to you there? Because you're saying there are some of your favorites. Yes. Uh, I'm trying to look down at my notes. Oh, Okay. In the agency, which is allegedly the CIA agency, mm -hmm. there was a board with nine monitors saying hotspots. One is uh, Chernobyl. 
One is uh, Newark with the riots. One is uh, Ukraine, et cetera, et cetera. And we decided to do one of Poland. So we took my co-writer, Dick Chudnow, who's this real small guy, into the other room and put him on the top of a ladder holding a light bulb in the ceiling. And four of the crew members, the largest guys, put on uh, tank tops and let their, their jeans go down to show their butt cracks and turn the ladder around while Dick is holding the light bulb, the classic Polish joke. Right. So we put that on one of the monitors. I get a call the next day from this same douchebag Disney uh, exec saying, you know, my wife is Polish, and I really am hit for that joke. Uh, these people do not seem to have ever seen a comedy film in their life. Well, I, I don't think this guy ever did. No. His claim to fame was The Santa Claus, and it was the only film he ever worked on. It was a major hit, yeah. and that's what gave him his title. And he wasn't knowledgeable. He wasn't hip. He wasn't funny. And he was just a major, major pain in the ass. It seems like it would be very difficult to me to give like those sorts of notes on a parody film, because if you see one of these movies in theaters, there's jokes that are going to get a huge laugh from like 10% of the audience. You can't like pick and choose what's going to make each segment of the audience laugh, because the whole thing about these types of movies is some jokes are going to hit everyone. And then there's other ones working in there for like a small segment of the audience. That's kind of what makes them work. But you also know that you do 10 jokes for every three you use. Mm. And this guy had no idea why anything worked. All he knew was if he copied the Zuckers and Abrams as much as he could, he would potentially have another airplane. He didn't know why airplane worked other than the fact that it cast, it did stunt casting for people you'd never think to cast. Mm. And the ultimate horrendous thing was he went back to Jim Abrams because Abrams was still friendly with Joe Roth. And he said, what do we got to do with this film? And Abrams said, no matter what you do, it's got to be 84 minutes. And ours was 96. And we cut a lot of really funny stuff that may or may not have played the extra time, but you had to give it a chance and he wouldn't hear it. 84 minutes or nothing. We, we've encountered a few films on the show where they've re- like the studio have really cut it down and it just loses some of the magic and the Avengers from the nineties was another one that pops to mind that suffered the same fate in that sense. But I suppose then we're in the production. Now you, you've got your cast in place. Script is done. You're directing and away oh yeah, off to the races, as they say, do you have any particular memories that stand out to you from just oh. actually filming it and, and putting it together? I've got uh, an entire page full. <laughs> I, I I'll preface it, I'll preface it with saying This is the most fun I've ever had in my entire life. Every single day, I woke up and pinched myself because I was looking forward to doing things that were created out of several good minds, mine among them, to be a little bit humble. And it just was incredible. And the greatest thing I had was my production designer. His name was Bill Krieber. And he had won Academy Awards for the original Planet of the Apes, Towering Inferno, et cetera, et cetera. At that point in time, we didn't have the money for CGI. We had to do things live. So he came up with ways we could do stunts actually on stage or on location. And he plotted out how to do them as puzzle pieces. Uh, He was a genius. And he taught me more than I ever learned in the previous 20 years I have worked. I was just looking him up, actually. Yeah, Towering Inferno, the Planet of the Apes films. It's got quite the uh, filmography, that man. Oh, yeah. He was inducted into the Art Director's Hall of Fame. He was amazing. Uh, so uh, going to, down the list, the one, the one sequence that really stands out that Disney fucked up again was the bridge sequence from the uh, combination True Lies and Line of Fire parody where the president's limo ends up on a drawbridge hung over the bridge. Mm -hmm. Our final shot is going to be Leslie in a helicopter taking a piece of the red and white striped uh, line from the tow bridge that had broken off, throwing it down like, um, what's that iconic Tom Hanks film? Uh, Shit. 
where the thing floats down, the feather floats down. Oh, Forrest Gump. Right, Forrest Gump. This would float down slow motion and end up on the trunk of the limo as it did in True Lies, thereby causing the limo to go into the drink. So we're all set up for this shot. I have seven cameras going with different angles, and I got a chopper that I want to fly by the sunset, being silhouetted by the sunset that Leslie's double was in, having allegedly thrown this chip over. And the we let we release the cable on the limo and it goes in the drink. And we're on a drawbridge 60 feet below the bridge, looking up at it. There's about 40 of us. Uh, and you can invent, you can imagine how tight this is, because if anything, this is a one shot like anything is a one shot. Mm -hmm. And the helicopter flies by and it's not low enough to block the sun. And these guys got to come back, put on the door to the chopper, fly back to Van Nuys all before sunset. And it's already five o'clock and we get a call from the safety officer saying there's a boat coming through and you've got to raise the drawbridge. So we've got to disconnect a rope, a remote camera in the top of the drawbridge, raise the drawbridge, wait till the boat goes through, lower the drawbridge, put the remote camera up and be ready for the shot. It's 10 minutes till seven. So the guy flies by and I, I'm on the walkie and I said, I hate to do this, but can you do one more pass and go lower about 10 feet? He says, yes. So he does it. It's silhouetted perfectly. We get all seven cameras. The limo goes in the drink. The splash goes up 60 feet in the air. Everybody who's down there breaks out an applause. And it's, it's maybe one of the great moments of history. <laughs> so now I'll give you the second greatest. Second greatest is the bus jump from speed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The stunt coordinator was a guy named Freddie Waugh, who had, again, a history of doing every major action movie you've ever seen. And he had both sons who were stunt people who have since become stunt people and directors, one of whom, Scott, directed the Baja 3000 and does all those Army Navy commercials, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Anyway, this is going to be Freddie's last stunt. And we have all the five buses from Speed. This particular one, he's built a cage inside. And in it, he's surrounded by all kinds of safety mattresses. And the bus is, is operated from there remotely. And we choose the Rose Bowl as a background because we can light it up with, I guess you know what condors are. Mm -hmm. They're, they're um, lifts that hold huge lights against the side. Sure. And the Rose Bowl has a gradually decreasing road opposite it that goes down about 45 degrees over two miles. So Freddie is going to drive the bus at his maximum speed, which is 60, down this incline, which will bring it up to 80. And I get, again, seven cameras, which we have, one of which is a remote that's uh, sitting right at the bridge that will uh, be triggered with a remote spark when the bus hits it and the bus will fly off this ramp we've built like they did for speed and fly into the air. Well, along the way, we have an assistant director every half mile giving us a progress report. And if there's any progress, Freddie in the bus has, a, has an immediate stop button. So we get number one's okay, number two's okay, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So Freddie's coming full speed. He never gets past 60 or so. He hits the bridge, the sparks go up, the, the bus flies 15 feet in the air and travels 60 feet and lands on its uh, tires. And the only thing that ha happens is the uh, side view mirror breaks off. So I'm behind a safety fence and how I did it, I never know because I got a chin high chain link in front of me and uh, I'm not the tallest, greatest athlete in the world, but so I had somehow jumped over that fence and ran to the bus and I, I yelled in the door, Freddie, Freddie, you okay? Well, he's obviously stunned from the stunt and he can't talk. Mm -hmm. So I figure he's unconscious or something, but then he wakes up and it was like, this was a second unit shot and we fed 400 people for lunch 
lunch being at like two o'clock in the morning because every stunt man in Hollywood wanted to see the stunt. It was incredible. It's it's two in a row now where you, you you've just narrowly got the shot. It's yes. uh it's um it's, it's starting to sound like this film um was as a bit of magic behind it. Like it it, it really had to you know, sort of get over a few hurdles to get made. I think it's uh it, I mean it sounds like you've got more though. So was there any other problems you had to overcome on the set? Yeah, uh, but let me go back. It's not luck, it's preparation. Mm -hmm. If you prepare every single shot, knowing exactly where everything is, if you've seen the stunt work, if you know where your cameras are because you've diagrammed them with the DP, mm -hmm. there's uh, very little luck involved unless it's bad luck, as it was in the bridge sequence where the contraption could never be seen in advance, only a model of it. And that was one of the few things I never saw in the dance. And that's why it didn't work. I was actually watching one of your videos on YouTube earlier where you broke down with your what you your your sort of your stills of how you wanted the bus scene to look. Right. Um yeah, so you, you really did put the effort in and and you actually you you're right. It was uh, preparation. Yes, everything was. And everything I've ever done. And what was ironic is when I was out in music videos, and I did them very early on. Uh, I would take the track and I would break it down and I would make my shots per time code so that when I rolled back to shoot the shot, I would only have to roll back an extra 10 seconds before the shot I needed and I wouldn't have to play through the whole thing. And that became the de rigueur for music videos after that, where the uh, record company would demand that they would tell them where the shots would land. And I think one of the really impressive things about Spy Hard is when you have, whether it's the bus jump sequence or the true lies stuff, you have to recreate moments from those films. And those films had like budgets of like a hundred million dollars. Like they had endless amounts of money to throw at creating these sequences and you have to do it on significantly less and yet have it so visually similar that the audience immediately makes the connection. True. And that that's cherry picking the iconic shots from that particular movie. Yeah, it's also, you know, having had 20 years of experience prior to making that movie, I pretty much know what you had to do to get the iconic shot. Mm -hmm. And I also, I'm such a fan of all those films mm. that, uh, that, you know, like you guys, they're in your memory. Yeah. And I mean, as a commercial director, did you feel like particularly well-trained to do like this type of parody filmmaking where it often works in these small chunks. Uh, yes, because that was my metier. I only got hired to do what I was good at. Uh, people that, that didn't hire me didn't hire me because I didn't fit in their uh, niche. And it became during my time, but much worse after, where unless they saw a commercial on your reel that was exactly like what they wanted to do, they wouldn't hire you. Right. And were you ever considered for some of the other Leslie Nielsen spoof movies that came later, like wrongfully accused or anything? No. No, okay. That was that was Pat Proft because Pat Proft had co-written all the Zucker Abrams stuff. Mm. So that was his directorial. He got that film, Wrongfully Accused, because I did Spy Heart. They allowed him to direct, which he'd never done, because they saw what I did. Right. We interrupt this program to bring you a special report. Calling all agents. Independent podcasting, much like the spy game, requires considerable resources. Whether it's research, equipment, hosting, or of course, constructing a top secret volcano lair, we're putting out the call for your support. That's right. As you may know, we've activated the Spy Hearts Patreon, home of our ever-growing lineup of Agents in the Field episodes where we decode non-spy films from your favorite spy actors and full film commentaries with more intel than a Basil Exposition briefing. Cam, what have we got in our crosshairs this month? Well, Leslie Nielsen may be the ultimate badass, but we're going to tackle the penultimate badass, Liam Neeson, with a full-length commentary on Taken. Get ready for some major dad action. And if that sounds delicious then become a true spy hard today and join the circus at patreon.com slash but 
before this message self-destructs. Cam, resume the spy jinx. So, you know, we're talking about, you, you spoke about some of the scenes you put together, the action sequences, but let's look at maybe the, some of the performances of the actual actors as well. I, one thing I liked about this film personally is, is there's a lot of fun chemistry between Leslie Nielsen and Nicola Sheridan. And that that doesn't always come naturally between actors. So was that something you worked on as a three? As a matter of fact, Leslie had already been kind of a ladies' man in his younger years. And as you well imagine, uh, Nicolette knows how to use her best attributes. She's not only fun, she is so sexy. And she's very playful. So mm. they got along well because she also knew he was the money. And she knew how to play to it. And she, I was very good friends with her. I still am. And uh, uh, she, I just, I would take her by the side in some sequences and I just whisper in her ear, do such and such or so and so. I think that'll be a winner. So I never had to talk to him about her because he, she could do almost anything she wanted to. Was there any scene in particular that was, Maybe perhaps apart from the see the action sequences, was there a scene that was quite difficult to put together for you, or difficult to direct? Something uh, obstacle you had to overcome. Oh, I'm trying to think. Well, let me let me go back uh, one page though. You wanted to know one more thing that I had to cut because of Disney's horrendous legal problems. Uh, we had a parody of the Green Mile in that uh, the uh, scientist who who has this chip is in jail and on his wall is a poster for the Green Mile. And behind the poster is a miniature set, like you see uh, uh, an actual miniature in a movie. And when the poster's ripped off, it reveals the miniature. Oh. Disney wouldn't let me use the Green Mile. So I had to- Is it Green Mile or Shawshank Redemption? Shawshank Redemption, I'm sorry, yeah, no you're problem. right. Uh, so I had to come up with a poster of a Russian woman weightlifter, which, although it was funny, it wasn't the same thing. Mm. Uh, at any rate, when it's ripped off, it reveals this little miniature of a whole bunch of people working in a mine. It was hilarious. Disney cut that because it wasn't an action sequence. Uh, but going back to, to Scott, your last question was... Just about like a particular sequence you had trouble shooting, a, an obstacle you had to overcome, perhaps, something to do with directing actors. A culp, culp was the only problem I had. And it mm. wasn't a problem. He just was a dick. We're, we're all like that some days, to be fair. Right, when I haven't other, had my coffee. Yeah. And the other one was, what's his name who plays the assistant in the agency? The gray-haired guy. God, Barry Bostwick. He was a... What a wonderful, wonderful man. When we're shooting the uh, end sequence in the hangar that has the nose cone, and the nose cone was actually uh, built upon my nose as a model. Uh, and uh, uh, so uh, he was supposed to be in charge of getting everybody out of there. And uh, Leslie, again, had one of his bad hangover days and wouldn't do the dialogue exactly as it was written, which was brilliant. And there was a cue in it several times for Barry to react a certain way or say a certain line, but Leslie would never say on script, so he didn't know what to do. So he came over to me and he said, I can't do this because he's not doing the cues. What do you want to do? I said, look at me out of the side of your eye and I'm going to raise my finger, index finger. At that point, do your line. And that was uh, the only thing that comes to mind at this point. Oh, no, that, yeah, that's fair. That, that was a, a particular problem that you overcame. And, and I've, I've met Barry Boswick in, in real life, and he was uh, very lovely. So I can definitely attest oh, to that, too. What, what a wonderful guy. Well, I was curious, when you're making this type of film, it has to be pretty planned out, I would think, because of the parodies. But like, is there a fair amount of room for improv? In terms of acting, yes, because most of these people are improv actors and they're really good at it. Mm. Uh, but the dialogue was brilliant as it was. It was just in certain circumstances, 
I allowed them to make up a line or two. The greatest improv guy turned out to be John Ailes. Hmm. And he came up with stuff. And this is, again, where I had a little bit of problem. Uh, John Ailes, who plays allegedly uh, Leslie's assistant, who has this crazy kind of Turkish, Iraqi, crazy accent, uh, is sitting with the car watching the bad guys with Leslie. And I got a long lens two shot on them. And uh, John is really good at improv. And he came to me and he said, I can't get this guy to allow me to make stuff up. And I know how good he was. And I said, I don't give a shit. Do it. So he did do it. And Leslie came down on him. So we went for another take. And he did it straight. So we went for another take. And he did his own version. And Leslie allowed it. Uh, So that worked out okay. But Leslie was not great at allowing other people to do stuff that he didn't tell them to do or solicit it. Hmm. That's understandable. I, I can see why, especially it, it, with, from what it sounds like to me, he's, he's like an actor's actor in a sense. He, he likes it to be defined. You spoke about Patrick Stewart earlier, actually, and he was exactly the same way in terms of an actor. He liked everything to go by the script and to be quite focused. Um, what I wanted to ask, and it, is that there's a couple of questions here. The first one is the music. Yes. Now, you've got two things I wanted to mention. Firstly, you've got Bill Conti. Right. Uh, done some Bond scores, scored many films, very famous composer. And then you've got Weird Al Yankovic. And a lot of people remember the theme tune to this film. So just could you take us through the, maybe the process of getting Bill Conti involved and, and getting Weird Al Yankovic involved? Well, first of all, Disney had rules and regulations about budgets, about this, about that, about legal, but they had a million dollar budget for music, which I thought was stupid. And I wanted to use, I mean, the great thing about Tarantino, he's probably the best guy at choosing music for films that there are in history. And I wanted to do some cool music cues. All they wanted was a major composer that they would approve and this huge budget for a 102 piece instrumental. And and my line producer had done two films with Bill Conti. So he was personal friends with him. So he took the script to him and this gigantic budget and Conti agreed to do it. Well, unfortunately we got in a real time bind at the very end of editing and re-editing because of focus groups for the previews and didn't give him a whole lot of time. And The score to me was really a letdown. Although I really like Bill, I like all his work. This just wasn't a hip score. Mm. And although some of the action sequence worked because he did a good score for action movies, I I just, I wanted something hipper and I just didn't get it. You wanted something more contemporary with more like popular music at the time. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, I, I suppose that sort of plays into the weird Al Yankovic of it all, because I, I mean, I've never, I can't declare myself a, a big fan of weird Al. I don't know when his peak period was particularly, but was that around the mid nineties? Yes. Yeah. And the reason that came about was uh, the film did not preview well. So I had to come up with some alternate ideas for shots, etc. And we never had a title sequence. What I wanted to do is I want to do the straight bond eye where he's in the iris and he, he runs back and forth. And mm-hmm. I wanted to do a parody where he always misses the iris. He runs <laughs> out of frame, he drops out of frame, he misses the shot, etc. They wouldn't do it because they refused to anything that was a direct copy of Bond. Huh. So uh, the editor came up with the idea of, why don't you try Al Yankovic? I said, why not? So he came in and he did that crazy sequence, which he storyboarded himself. And and, uh, that's how it was very, very popular. Uh, I also wanted at the end, because the ending sucked and we didn't have an ending, I wanted to do a parody of at the time there was a Coolio video. Can't remember which one it was. I think it was his first one. And I wanted to do Leslie playing Coolio doing a music video at the end. Uh, and Disney wouldn't allow that either. Was that Gangster's Paradise where he's in the school? Yes. 
exactly. Yeah. Well, uh, so Weird Al came in and storyboarded the sort of Thunderball esque right. credit sequence. Wow, he did that himself. So he's obviously got a bit of uh, a Bond fandom in, in 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 himself. Yeah. Well, I don't know if he did it himself. He may have had somebody do it for him. Mm, okay. So, but he came in and well, him and his team made the song. It wasn't yes. something you pitched to him or no. anything like that. Wow. Okay. Oh yeah, yeah. I pitched him that I want something Bondian. Okay. Okay, that so that was your notes to him was something Bondian, and he took yes. that away and gave you back. Okay, yeah, and I, I said about the silhouettes and the different colors and all that that you see in a Saul Bass title sequence. And so, when you had the film done, like, was the studio happy with it? It did not preview well, so yeah. we had to go shoot some more shots. We lost 12 of my jokes and gained six other ones, which weren't necessarily any funnier. I want to do a major. Mission Impossible was coming out the same weekend. I want to do a major parody of that and have all three guys floating, uh, three guys meaning Leslie, John Ailes, and Nicolette, floating in the capsule, which we borrowed from uh, Ron, uh, what's his name? And um, it was going to be very expensive, but John Ailes was so good at making up uh, my father used to say, or my ancestors used to say such and such, and he always came up with a funny. So if we attached a funny to them floating, that would have gotten us the Mission Impossible thing. But Disney just wouldn't go for the money or directly copying a movie they have yet to see, which is coming out like in two weeks. Right, and it's interesting that um, by the time, like say something like the Austin Powers sequels roll around, they're actually spoofing movies that are opening the same summer. So you would have been ahead of the curve if you'd been doing that. Correct. Yeah, and, and I always wanted to be because whatever you're parodying has to be pretty contemporary mm -hmm. or no, you know, because the basic basic audience is 10 to 24 year old males and they're not going to remember shit before that. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I, I was going to actually talk about the, the James Bond references. Um, that's something I wanted to touch on, but you actually mentioned something just before about James Bond. And I wanted to sort of question that a little bit more because you said, they, the Disney didn't want you to make a, a very close copy of James Bond or any particular you know, main part of the Bond franchise. But there are several very close homages to Bond in this film. So oh, it's yeah. Interesting, yeah, it's interesting that you get away with some things, but they wouldn't let you do others. That's because I was constantly in the rewrite phase and, and then the legal phase, which caused rewrites, fighting that that fine line between what was directly a copy and what was indirectly a copy. For instance, we had the sequence of going from the director of the CIA to the lab and then to on the field. We couldn't do that sequence. We had to shuffle it because it was too James Bondian. But we ended up cutting it the same way James Bond does. And, and what's that? Just Disney legal being unsure or was it a litigious? Uh, sort of Eon Productions, you know, trying to get these references taken out. Was that something that actually was coming back from the Bond producers or was that more just Disney being scared? Disney's paranoia was justified in that the family that owned the Bond rights were the most litigious family in the history of movies. And had they known about this, I don't think they even knew it was being made, they would have been up in arms. So it was Disney's paranoia over what they would say and what they would do. I had to highlight a script and describe every single shot in the script of what it parodied and why, why it differed and why it didn't differ. Wow. And that's just to get through legal. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Because we recently spoke about uh, Never Never Again, the uh, Bond, not Bond film from the 80s where Sean Connery came back to the role. And the amount of back and forth in terms of legal and lawyers and stuff with Eon and the people who made Bond it was insane. So I can understand Disney being cautious. Yes. Some of the Bond references that did make the film. I mean, the first thing I want to touch on is you've got a Bond girl in the film. You spoke about Joanna Lumley earlier, right? who, of course, was in On a Majesty's Secret Service. But right. you've got Talisa Soto from License to Kill. Yeah, but nobody knew who she was. We got her because she was friends with the DP. 
Mm -hmm. And uh, when she came to the set to shoot the still photo that's used in her folder with Leslie Holds Up, she came on the set with just a t-shirt and jeans. And Nicola Sheridan, who is not a bad looking lass, saw her and said, who in the fuck is that? <laughs> she, was the, she was the most gorgeous thing I've ever seen. I, you know, I, I, I won't really get an opportunity to ever speak to Talisa. So I'll ask you, what was it like just to work with Talisa for that, that very short scene? Oh, she was a sweetheart. Just really nice. Just sort of up for the, the, the laugh of it, really, because it's, oh, it's, it's a parody, isn't it? So, yeah. Okay. Absolutely. One of the things I think is really interesting in terms of Bond connections is like Bond was on very shaky ground for quite a long time and then has a real resurgence in, uh, I believe November of 1995 and your movie rolls around like seven months later. So like in many ways, the timing was kind of perfect, but when you, when you were putting the movie together, did you have any sense of, you know, a bond movie is coming, this could be a big deal. No, not at all. Uh, I just, you know, growing up like you guys, every summer, my movie to get up for was a bond film, Mm -hmm. but I, I never thought that this would be in any way related because it's such a different audience and such a smaller audience. Right. And so moving on from, I mean, there are plenty of other James Bond references, but yeah, my favorite ones are, I think, the Talisa Soto appearance and the Thunderball-esque credits. But yeah, we mentioned the cameos earlier and and Disney giving you that sort of $50,000, I believe you said it was, to sort of get these sort of stunt casting people and these celebrities to appear. You mentioned Ray Charles and the bus, but you know, you got Mr. T, Hulk Hogan turns up for a bit. Um, was there any in particular you enjoyed working with Fabio there as well? Ray Charles. Ray yeah. Charles. So I'll give you an anecdote here. First of all, Ray Charles uh, was a ladies man. And Nicolette sat next to him on a bench as I'm describing the scene. And he very, not at all secretively, is inching his hand closer and closer up her thigh. And Nicolette, who's playful, just kept moving his hand, and he kept putting it back. At any rate, he gets in the driver's seat. He says, okay, now where's the gear shift? And he says, oh, yeah, I got it. And where's the brake? Oh, yeah, I got it. So he does that. So now we have five buses from Speed. I think I told you this. Mm-hmm. And this particular one is lit from uh, uh, the top. The, the actual driver is on top of the bus. And Ray Charles is driving the bus remotely, playing like he's actually driving. We're on Hollywood Boulevard the night before Christmas, which is all lit up throughout the boulevard. So we see things through the window as we're driving the bus. And uh, Leslie and Nicolette are waiting on the sidewalk to board the bus. Uh, Coming down the sidewalk are, are three quite overweight women with matching velour uh, sweatsuits. They look like they're right out of Branson, Missouri. And they're walking toward Leslie and Nielsen, completely uh, impervious to what's happening. They get almost, and I can see what's happening. I'm the only guy on the bus who isn't an extra. I'm hunkered down with my monitor in the back of the bus. And I look out the window and I see him coming and I know what's gonna happen. Or at least I feel what's gonna happen. The bus door opens, Leslie and Nielsen are about to board. These three women see Ray Charles in the bus, look at each other like they just lost their false teeth and must have run full speed back to the airplane, back to the grounds in Missouri. <laughs> What's happening in Hollywood? I've got to get out of here. Exactly. <laughs> uh, I, yeah, I, I'm glad Ray Charles was, was fun to work with. Um, I, I, and I was just thinking, like you mentioned, because it was if we're looking at the production of a whole now, you've basically shot it all. You're talking about the post-production, the the test screenings. Obviously, there was some feedback on it. You did some reshoots. Was there anything that was cut that you wish was still in the final product? Oh, yeah. I, I mean, unfortunately, I didn't make a list. There was one shot that sold the entire bridge sequence of the limo hanging over, mm-hmm. a super wide establishing shot where you could see the entire drawbridge and the car a little in the frame. You could see it was five stories tall. They cut it. Mm. They cut anything, and they cut a lot of other things, uh, many of which I don't have 
down here. Oh, one of which was we had an amphibious plane on a lake in a park here. It's a man-made lake that the guy who built the plane allowed us to use for free just so we'd give him the footage and the rights. But they wouldn't allow us to drive the plane on the lake because it was too unsafe. So they cut that shot. And it was incredible. It was backlit, long lens, beautiful. I'm looking at other stuff on my list. God, I didn't write them all down. I mean, the one thing that killed me was the Doc Martens because I wanted to start the shot of, of introducing this character as a close up on a pair of Doc Martens. Right. Mm. So that being lost. Uh, I just I just can't shake the image of Patrick Stewart in the role now. That's uh, that's just in my head. Well, you know who I liked even better? I can't remember his name. The Madness of King George guy. Was it Nigel Hawthorne? Yes, Nigel Hawthorne. He was so good in that film, but he also struck me as a bombastic, Bondian character like uh, the guy who played Ernst Blofeld. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Donald Pleasance. And and Patrick Stewart is just such a wonderful actor uh, that he would have been wonderful, but uh, I think uh, Nigel would have been even better. I suppose I, I suppose like I'm wrapping up my questions on Spy Hard, but I, I really want to give you the, the the floor here, Rick. Is there any sort of anecdotes or stories that you haven't shared that, you, that you'd like to share with us before we wrap it up? Uh, two, one fun, one not so fun. Go for it. Leslie was known for this fart machine that he used to carry in his hand, and the wonderful thing about him playing things straight was, as he told me, you never break your straight face. And on the commercials, I've been many places, he did this as a joke to crack people up and it was successful. The best of which was after the third series of commercials, we premiered them at the Peninsula Hotel here. And uh, afterwards, at, outside the Peninsula Hotel where the parking circle is, there's three steps. On the lowest step is Leslie and his girlfriend. On the second step, was two young women professionals in suits. And on the third step is my wife and I. Knowing what did, but uh, Leslie is capable of, I, we're all waiting for our cars. I hear the fart. These two women exchange a look of horror. They don't know who he is or what it is. And I'm just trying my damn to control my laughter. Uh, he does it again, doesn't look around. They look at each other again, aghast. Finally, his Rolls Royce or Bentley drives up. He goes to the car, turns around. They recognize who it is, and they fall off their shoes with laughter. Hmm. And I saw him do this trick a hundred times. It worked every time. It was one of his great feats. That's the fun thing. The not fun thing is previewing and studios. This nerd executive decided for my preview to have an open preview to all audiences. And I said, no, this film is going to show to boys, mainly 10 to 14, but maybe 14 to 24. Anybody else in the audience is going to hate this film. And the focus group afterwards showed exactly that, exactly what I said. Mm -hmm. So after much cutting and uh, not yet doing the reshoots, we do a second preview. The cutting had, had been so painful, I could barely watch the preview. And although it was better, it still wasn't up to the standards, primarily because we didn't have an ending. So the previewing phase is the single most important thing in a comedy. If people laugh, it's funny. It's going to show and people are going to laugh. If it's targeted correctly in its ad budget to the right kind of people. And I can't stress this enough. It's got to be the right people to the right audience. Fortunately, even though it was up against an incredible stiff competition with Speed, Mission Impossible, uh, et cetera, et cetera, it did do third at the box office. And Disney was smart enough. And they were the smartest distribution people for world. And they let it out the week after it was shown here, which was unheard of. And it grossed $60 million overseas. And it only grows 30 here because they love Leslie Nielsen films and they love comedies. It was number one at the box office in France and Germany and Italy and Spain for weeks. 
Mm-hmm. And home, unfortunately, at that time, uh, home videos were not uh, out of out of fashion. So it did thirty million dollars in home videos, all of which I saw this much money from. So zero, yeah. Um, I I did have a question. You know, Leslie Nielsen passed away yes. in twenty ten. Yes. And this was 1990, you know, six, this movie comes out. Did you have much, you know, interactions with him from that movie to the end of his life? I touched base with him from time to time, but the experience for me was, had soured so much because he was such a dick that I, A, didn't need him. Uh, I was getting offers for other stuff. And B, I was very soured on movie stars in general, mm. but especially on him. I knew if I did another Leslie Nielsen film, the experience would be the same or worse. Right. Well, then I, I suppose that takes us towards the end of the sort of spy hard chat. I think the question I'd like to wrap up with to you, Rick, is what is your favorite moment in the film, looking back on it now? God, I don't know if there's a single one telling you the, the anecdotes that I told you were my favorites. Uh, there's got to be a scene you point to and go, no, that's, that's fun. I like that. Well, again, a scene that was massively cut because, and it's because the dialogue was so brilliant was Marsha Gay Harden facing Leslie off when he's on the bed and she's trying to extract the chip from his mouth. And this was like a three page or four page dialogue scene, the dialogue of which was incredible. And Marsha was incredible. And uh, I can't describe it to you, but it was all, it was all plays on words. Mm-hmm. It's not out innuendo, it's innuendo, et cetera, et cetera. And it was just, it just played like a violin. It was wonderful. Cut down from a four page scene to a half page scene. It, it's it's a shame that a project you clearly were very passionate about when you started off with it. Obviously, you know your son co-wrote it. That's such a a cool thing to be able to bring into the world. Oh yeah. Um, I, it's, it's a shame that your experience with Disney and it, it by it and also a stretch, Leslie as well, though he had his demons, of course. Um, soured you on the project because there's still a lot of fun in there you know we're reviewing it this week as well and we found a lot of stuff that we enjoy about the film in in 2022 i can't watch it really yeah I, because it's just it's so painful for me to see what was altered what was cut the primary thing that they did which is the most painful is they cut all of the good dialogue and all the good story and i said no matter what funny this is no matter what it parodies, it has to have a storyline. Mm-hmm. They said no one gives a shit about the story. All they care about is jokes. Airplane has a story. I know. They have to lay in an airplane. Like it's- so did Spy Hard. Well, I, I suppose the next thing, you know, if that wraps us up on Spy Hard, the next thing I want to touch on is kind of what the genesis of Spy Hard was, which is, you know, you worked with your son and he has gone on to do several comedy films including working with leslie no he never worked with leslie well the, the franchise he started had leslie and i should i should preface it he was in the later scary movies but he wrote the first one they, they wrote the first one which they sold to weinstein mm. and uh weinstein hired what's his name keenan ivory wayans to direct it which i guess mm. was not a real good experience so weinstein came back to my son and his partner to write a second one which they did. And they didn't use that because that went to David Zucker. So then they went on and they wrote a third one, which they got to uh, Regency Films. And Regency uh, went through a bunch of directors that they didn't like. So they came back to my son and his partner and they said, "Uh, we didn't like that last guy who made you work with him. What do you think? And they said, uh, well, why don't you let us direct it? And so Regency allowed them to go make a little five minute trailer sample to show them directing. And through that, they got their own film, which was a called... uh, Was that Date Movie? Date Movie. Mm. And that put them on the map. They made it for uh, $19 million for $19 million 
and it grossed almost as much as Fly Hard. So then they did a second film for Regency and a third. Then they did their own. At any rate, they've made five mil- five films back to back. I suppose the, the question then, it, it, you know, it's interesting that you've kept it in kind of the comedy vein as a family. Um, have you ever helped them along with any of their projects or been involved in any way with any of the films they've made? No, other than giving them guidance on their trailer for their directorial debut uh, and visiting them on the set of date movie and telling them one suggestion, nothing. Everything they did, they did by themselves and they were pretty adamant about it. And why wouldn't you be? You don't want your dad telling you what to do. (laughs) And also they're, they're far different filmmakers than I am. As I said, I'm a fanatic on prep, which they are, but I'm also a fanatic on the look, production design, camera angles, et cetera, because I've been doing it for 30 years. They didn't. Mm -hmm. And their their thing is the joke. Does the joke work? Is the joke the parody we want? Is it big enough? And my stuff was never as big and broad as theirs. I would never have... uh, a Jennifer Lopez parody with an ass the size of a GM truck. I would just have it real big. And that's the major difference between the two of us that never caused any conflict. It's just, I'm a different kind of filmmaker than they are. And I also, I'm not as great a fan of broad comedies as they are. Mm -hmm. I like stuff like, as I said, Snatch, Lockstock. One of my favorite films was the sequel to uh, that, uh, shit, Guy Ritchie did it. Game of Spies, Game, um, Sherlock Holmes gave him spies. Mm. To me, that's the kind of film I like to make. Mm-hmm. It's got production design, it's got camera angles, it's got good stunts, it's funny, the dialogue's good. It's just, it's the kind of stuff I like to do. Mm-hmm. So I suppose moving on from Spy Hard then in terms of your career, you go on to write a book, which I'm going to talk about just a little bit in a minute, but I was looking for your IMDb. Is there anything you worked on particularly? Because you did some TV work afterwards, I found, but anything you were looking to do afterwards? Is there any projects you've you've been trying to get made, anything like that? Yes. I unfortunately, again, because I don't come from Hollywood and didn't get raised in the Hollywood community, I was stupid, naive, and arrogant. And I turned down probably 80 scripts, 76 of which never got made, the other four of which sucked. And I wanted to do a film I could show to my friends that I was proud of. Uh, So I told you this guy from Canada came to me with a script that I really loved. And I had like four different producers that wanted to do it as an independent. And I sucked in my belt. And I said, we can do this film for $15 million, which again, they didn't think I could, but I knew I could in Canada because it had a Canadian writer. uh, And I couldn't get it made because I said that was the height of the Me Too decade. And so I had three other, uh, what I call pet projects that never got made because I had stayed stayed too long away from the ball. I became the oldest virgin at the prom. Uh, that's okay. Well, I suppose that then that pivots my question over to your book. Now, you wrote a book entitled Hollywood War Stories, How to Survive the Trenches, which um, there it is right there. Very <laughs> well placed. I like that. Um, but yeah, what inspired you to commit your stories to a book? My kids told me, we used to swap stories. Uh, two of my kids are in show business. My daughter is a TV costume designer. She won an Emmy for Big Little Lies. Oh, nice. And my son, as you know, is a writer, director. And they said, you know so much. And notes you've given us over the years about people you know, shots you've done, et cetera, et cetera. Why don't you teach? And I had met this guy at Universal Studios who did all the ancillary materials for home video. And I came to him with a project I wrote called uh, Making Movie Magic how to make action sequences out of both live action, CGI, et cetera. And he said, if I get Universal to fund this, we can take some of their films as clips and show how they are done vis-a-vis the screen screen, et cetera. So to vet that, I taught a class at UCLA in in making movie magic, how you Mm -hmm. actually do it. And because I knew everybody who were major people in stunts, casting, DPs, 
et cetera, et cetera. I invited them as guest lecturers and I had this uh, course uh, and I was about to make the uh, making movie magic when this guy was fired. So he couldn't get Universal to commit. Uh, so the teaching the class led me to doing the book because I used all the notes from teaching the class in the book. Fair enough. Okay. So like, what are you, I, I, I haven't read the book at this time. I haven't got a copy of it, but what are you trying to, to say with the book? Is it really about, is it, is it for people who are looking to become directors or actors? Is it, is it, who is it for? It's for people who want to be either already a writer or already a director, but they want to make something mainstream. And it's all the obstacles you have and how to overcome them with some humor and anecdotal examples thrown in from commercials I did, from videos I did, from movies I did. And it's rules. For instance, one chapter is called Good Ideas Don't Just Fall Off a Turnip Truck. Hmm. Uh, and uh, each, cap, each chapter is a rule to follow if you want to make it and stay in the business. Well, no, and we'll have links to that in the show notes for sure. And so it really is just about navigating the entertainment industry as a professional. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Well, Rick, as we start to wrap up here, and as Cam said, we'll have links in the show notes below for the book. For people can go and check it out if they want to learn more about that. We like to vet our guests and check their spy credentials as we are a spy movie podcast. So uh, I have a couple of quick fire questions for you to wrap us up. Are you, are you ready? Okay. 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 Ready. What is your favorite spy movie? I don't know if you'd consider it a spy movie, but I'll tell you a movie I was really attracted to is Eye in the Sky. Oh, okay. Yeah. Right. That was such a well crafted little thing. Uh, I just, I, I don't understand why I didn't perform better. Yeah, that's the surveillance thriller with Helen Mirren, right? And Alan Rickman? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And I'm trying to think of what else. My God, when you get as old as me and you've seen as many films as I've seen, <laughs> uh, you can't, you just can't pick them out. Oh, I'll tell you what I really loved. The Mission Impossible, the last one that Tom Hanks did in the Vienna Opera House. That was also really well crafted. Fallout, I believe. What is it? Which one was it? Mission Impossible yeah. Fallout. Yeah. It has Henry Cavill in it as well. Yeah. Yeah. That's, uh, yeah. Uh, that, interestingly, as a franchise, they seem to have gotten better as they went on, which is like the, uh, the inverse of Re Diminishing Returns. It's quite nice to see. Same with Batman. Batman Returns was really good. That train sequence was amazing mm. and the new batman well i think the actor was not up to par as the movie maker it's a wonderfully made movie it is yeah well okay so you it's actually interesting because you've given us two answers in terms of spy movies that we've never had before so i appreciate that um the next question uh you've already professed your love for james bond so this should be an easy one for you what is your favorite james bond movie god I know it's hard to pick one. It, 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 it's well, no, it's, it's not hard to pick some because I only like the Sean Connery ones above all else. Okay. And which was the one Talisa Soto was in? She's in License to Kill with Timothy Dalton. I think I like that the best. Wow, okay. It, it, it's, it's been uh, it's being reapprised recently, uh, quite recently. It's, um, I think in, in the light of Daniel Craig's more uh, serious action films that he's made for the Bond, I think uh, Timothy Dalton's getting a lot of love. So it's nice to see. Uh, a good, it's a good choice too. It's, um, it, it's definitely a very different vibe compared to some of the other, most of the other Bond films, I'd say. Yeah. To Live and Let Die was also great. Very fun one. And well, I, I suppose you've technically answered this next question. I, it's who is your James Bond, but I think you said it was Sean Connery. Absolutely, Sean Connery. However, if I was asked to direct the next James Bond, it would be Idris Alba. I, I would be behind that. I love the guy. He's fantastic. Right. What I will say in terms of our chat today, Rick, about Spy Hard is I want to thank you firstly for taking the time to speak to us i mean it i'm glad the story of this film is being told i think uh, there's a lot of elements about this film that are, that are mm -hmm. very interesting and 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 
I'm a big Leslie Nielsen fan. I always have been. So to see him in my favorite genre, which is a spy film, is like the ultimate combination for me. And you helped, well, you brought that vision to life. So I can only thank you for that. And I can only thank you for your time today, Rick. So, so thank you so much for joining us. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. And um, if people want to learn more about you, where can they find you? I know you have a website. I think it's uh, rickfreeberg.com. Correct. And we'll put links to that in the show notes below. So Rick, once again, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Good luck. Yes, thank you so much. Well, there you go, folks. That was our chat with the director of this week's film, Spy Hard, Mr. Rick Friedberg. Now, before we continue, we did receive an email from Rick with a quick clarification on something he said in the interview, and we're going to read it out right now. Yeah, so Rick just wanted to clarify his comments regarding his work with Leslie Nielsen, so I'm just going to read it out as he sent it. He said, yes, according to him, he was sometimes overserved, but during Spy Hard, he was also under a lot of stress, both with his live-in girlfriends, but also he had just come off a personally negative experience with Mel Brooks's Dracula. He was promised much involvement, but was never contacted or consulted until the preview in New York. The film was just not funny except to me, the mirror scene, and did not fare well at the box office. Both of these things led to him spending whole weekends over-serving himself. Before Spy Hard, I worked with him for five years, three seasons of dollar rent-a-car commercials, and two summers of golf instruction made for home video vids. And he was gracious and fun. A very classy move from Rick to clarify his stance. You know, the best relationships are often tumultuous, um, and I'm sure they had their ups and downs in their relationship and their time in Hollywood together, much like we do, Cam. That's right. And I mean, you know, film is often very tense when you're creating something, and not every production goes swimmingly for all involved. So obviously, Leslie had some, you know, personal issues at the time, but. Ultimately, it comes down to what's on screen. And I think for us, you know, there was a lot of parts where Leslie Nielsen really did still deliver. Absolutely. And, you know, speaking of delivering, I think we really delivered with the behind the scenes on Spy Hard and exploring the story of the film. Cam, what do you think? What I find really interesting about talking about a movie like Spy Hard is that when you ask you know, a general audience member or just people you know about some of these spoof movies. I think there's a real kind of almost like a condescending, like, oh, they just throw those together anyway. Like, there's just, there's no real thought about the process that goes into making a comedy like this and how it, it has to be really well calibrated. And just listening to him talk about, A, the preparation involved in pulling off all of these sequences, but also having to recreate multi-million dollar Hollywood magic, essentially on the cheap. I mean, a like 18 million dollar budget or whatever you know the budget was on this it was not high that's really really difficult to do and we should know we we try and remake everyone else's magic on podcasts every week on this show and we fail miserably <laughs> yes we are no mark Marin. <laughs> no no we are not um I, I don't want to be joe rogan to be fair no but you know it, it is testament to the skill that does go into these uh films it, it it's interesting because you're right, people do just dismiss them out of hand. It's just a little comedy film. But Rick was tasked with recreating scenes from Speed, recreating scenes from E.T. The, these things don't come cheap, and he managed to deliver it basically on budget. Yeah, and I found that really interesting because I think when you sit down with you know some of the directors who've made, say, a Bond movie or something along that kind of line, like there's a lot more respect given, I think, from an audience in terms of like, how did you construct that sequence? Well, let me tell you. What I found really just fascinating about this interview was to hear a filmmaker working in a genre that's not typically well treated critically outside of kind of the odd ones, like maybe, you know, the first Naked Gun or Airplane, but hearing him talk about the process that goes into a movie like this, how, you know, the frustrations can suddenly mount up in terms of dealing with a studio, in terms of which jokes to keep, what jokes to cut, and how that process... I think a lot of people have a general sense that these movies aren't really... There's not a lot of concern during the creative you know, the creative process, like whether it's the studio or even the filmmakers. And I think this interview really underlined just how much, as you said, how much he cared about this film, the battles he had to fight the gags that were lost, the sequences he was never able to achieve or that were cut, you know, in the writing phase. I found all of that just really interesting in terms of the evolution of what could be easily looked at as a 80-minute silly comedy. And, and, you know, yeah, we've spoken to, I think, two comedy directors now, Ross and Marshall Ferber. We had it very early on in the show to talk about Central Intelligence. And, and now Rick has joined those ranks. 
very different comedy films requiring very different things of their directors but you could definitely tell that the people involved in this cared. Now, what has appeared from this discussion is that Disney maybe didn't care, uh, which is a shame, uh, or, or or maybe cared in the wrong way, um, because you know we had some issues with certain bits of the film. I think um, when yep. we reviewed it earlier this week, and it it's starting to look like to me. And and I would consider myself uh, an expert on 1998's The Avengers. You know, we've reviewed <laughs> it. We've spoken to the director. We've spoken to the writer. We've even done a Patreon commentary on it. When you can find out more about that, patreon.com slash spyhards, hashtag cheap plug. But this film is starting to sound like a little bit like The Avengers when it comes to its production history. It had a low budget. It was asked to do a lot. It when it started out the the idea changed a lot because originally it was really um, emerging lots of different films like it mentioned the Goodfellas and things like that. Disney said no no we want homages to action films okay so the idea is changing Avengers was going to be this sort of black and white weird comedy at one point it wasn't meant to be a summer blockbuster but it became that and then the film was shot and then it was shown to test audiences and it gets shredded to pieces reshoots. Same story here. And that's um, that's interesting because a lot of people talk about the Avengers now. I mean, not a ton of people, but it has a following. People are calling for the Chechik cut, as it were. Um, I'm not saying there's a free bird cut out there. I think Rick has, has basically washed his hands with the film. And I can understand why you would. Some of the stuff he had to deal with at the time. But it's interesting to see. And this is why I, I love doing the interviews for the show. It's interesting to see the reality of creating a film. I remember recently we had M from Verbal Diorama on the show. We were talking about Salt. You remember a few weeks back when we spoke about the Angelina Jolie film. And she said, you know, making a film is hard. And it's a, it's, it's a miracle that a film actually gets on the big screen. Much less is good. Much less is good. Um, and so you've got to keep in mind, it's easy to dismiss this. But I think it's a miracle in the sense that it got made. And I think Rick fought a lot for this film. And I think there's still bits that we liked about this film. And I think without Rick, we wouldn't have got any of that. Yeah, and it's like a movie that I noticed the other day, Scott, when you were watching this movie for research, you put up on Twitter like, hey, watching Spy Hard right now. Anyone remember this movie? And there was a lot of people that jumped in and were like, oh, I do. Like, I watched that, you know, as a teenager or as a kid. And I remember thinking it was really funny. Like, it definitely had an audience. I mean, I talked about it in the review episode. But for me, I mean, I was someone who'd, you know, really gotten into the Leslie Nielsen comedy films. And so it wasn't even a question of, are you going to watch Spy Hard? Of course I was going to watch Spy Hard coming off of, you know, the Naked Gun films and what have you. Yeah, I'm surprised I hadn't watched it, we, as I discussed on the episode. But like, I'm surprised it never really gone on my desk because I had been a massive fan of, of Nielsen's work. I I love um, Naked Gun. I love Airplane. All that sort of stuff. U- ultimately, I think, and this is, I say, it's why I like doing these interviews. I, I love to find out what really happened with these films, especially the ones that aren't ex- as explored. Because we've had our bond interviews and they're fantastic it's lovely to hear from some of the actors and bond films and the people that made them john glenn fantastic but you know you think about like wendell wellman Mm -hmm. who who wrote firefox he's never really done an interview about that film and it was so cool to hear those stories for the first time and i think again this is what is great about this spy hard chat that we had with rick that he got to tell his story about the film and i'm glad it, it was us who shared it And just issues we had with the film, like you and I both brought up like the ending is incredibly abrupt. And to hear him actually say, the ending's really abrupt. (laughs) And you're like, oh, oh, and actually explain to us what he wanted to do with the ending suddenly made a lot more sense because sometimes when you see these issues in a movie, whether it's Spy Hard or anything else you watch where you go like, oh, that's awkward. People will very often point to the director or a writer even, mm-hmm. and and say like, well, that's a clear example of someone, you know, botching a job. But then you hear a story as to, well, hold on, the studio hated whatever was going to come at the end and hacked it off, and that's how suddenly things get more complicated. We like to assign a lot of um, artistic responsibility to the director, usually, and 
often there are outside factors that can interfere with what you wind up seeing projected on the screen. You just look at um, one of our more recent films, Munich, The Edge of War. We spoke to its writer, Ben Power, and he had more scenes that he'd written for some of the characters that we missed. Some of the female characters had more scenes and we lamented the lack of them in the movie and we found out they were there. Just the studio didn't want them and so they weren't in the film. Same thing happened with Bridge of Spies. When we spoke to Matt Charm, he told us all about the stuff he wrote for Amy Ryan's character. Barely in the film. Yeah. And I think I think that's a shame. But, you know, they, yeah, Rick told us that the, the studio exec spoke to Zucker, I believe it was. He said, 84 minutes in and out. And that's what this film is, more or less. Uh, I, and, you know, ultimately, I'm just, I'm just glad we got to hear these stories and really got to contextualize this film. And I, and I hope you've all enjoyed it. And I thought it was really fun when we were talking about, you know, the movie is called Spy Hard. We are called Spy Hard. So we sort of loosely based our name on that. Uh, not fully. It was sort of like we went through a few titles, but I really loved when he mentioned that when his uh, son and his son's, um, you know, co-writing partner, Aaron Seltzer, came up with the um, initial concept, it was called Live and Let Spy, which was one of the other titles we considered for this podcast, one of the other names. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I heard that and I thought, oh, God, he's got our number, hasn't he? He's... Uh... It, it just means that actually i'll tell you what i tell you what it means it means that we are at the level of uh studio writers that's right so we should uh we should be writing spy films Cam. <laughs> spy hard 2 coming to you soon electric boogaloo coming to um to be <laughs> to be <laughs> probably on paramount plus as well <laughs> uh, only in canada well, again, I, I thanked him on the episode, but I want to thank Rick for taking the time to talk to us. And I want to thank you all for taking the time to listen to two episodes this week. I know sometimes it's a stretch and your time is precious, but thank you for spending that time with us. Cam, the question goes to you, sir. What are we doing next week? Well, Scott, as we're celebrating 100 movies reviewed on Spy Hards, we are going to re-examine the knock list. We've got a lot of great films on that list. Which one's the best? We are going to crown the winner. This doesn't mean that we're wrapping up the show. We're going to keep adding films to the knock list as we go. But we thought as we've reached triple digits now, we would look back at the films that have made the knock list and try and figure out which one's the best. Uh, and we're going to pit some films off against each other. We're going to do a little bracket system and basically crown a winner. And we're going to have a little bit of fun along the way and a couple of... Uh, couple of surprises up our sleeve for next week so uh your mission should you choose to accept it is to join us for our celebration next week as we crown the best of the knock list and if you liked what you heard on the show this week please consider leaving us a five star review wherever you get your podcasts and do not forget to follow us discreetly on social media at spyhards that's s-p-y-h-a-r-d-s on facebook twitter and instagram but until next week, listeners, I wasn't even in my girl too.